Welcome to the 35th session in the first module of the course Signals and Systems, where we continue our discussion on convolution. In the previous lecture, we had looked at discrete convolution and we had used a very simple and yet effective analogy called the train platform analogy. So, we thought of convolution as a point by point or step by step interaction between the passenger sitting in a train and the passenger standing on the platform, where corresponding passengers shake hands and the combined effect of the handshake is what we record as the value of the convolution at every step. And then you had this train move by one step and there was a new effective handshake and there you are. Now, we go on to continuous independent variable convolution and we like to build the same idea and to evolve a methodology for calculating the convolution of two continuous time functions. In fact, here let us begin with an example again. So, we will begin with the very simple example of convolving two rectangular pulses and for variety we will take those rectangular pulses to be of different lengths or different sizes, so to speak. Let us put down the question that we want to address. So, what we are trying to do is to create a continuous independent variable convolution. We have two continuous independent variable functions, let us call them x 1 t and x 2 t. And we wish to calculate the convolution, which we will of course, represent as usual by a star and that is calculated to be x 1 lambda x 2 t minus lambda d lambda integrated over all lambda. This is done for each t and now as I said, we will take the example of two rectangular pulses. x 1 t is a rectangular pulse. Let us be relatively general now, instead of trying to restrict it to 0 or anything of that kind. Let this rectangular pulse go from T 1 to T 1 plus capital T 1 on the axis of T. And of course, let the rectangular pulse have a height of A. Let x 2 T be the rectangular pulse beginning at T 2 and going up to T 2 plus capital T 2 with a height of b. Now, without loss of generality, let t 2 be greater than t 1. So, you know here there is a choice to be made. We can convolve x 1 with x 2 or we can notionally convolve x 2 with h x 1. However, we must now review the idea that we had established earlier. We had asked this question before, specifically when we talked about how we would process an input going through a linear shift invariant system. We had talked about the commutativity of convolution. Let us just review that idea once again. So, I had asked you to prove at that time I had left as an exercise for you to prove that convolution is commutative. I am sure many of you must have attempted that exercise by now, but let me now carry out the proof, because it is a very important idea. So, let me prove that convolution is commutative. What I mean by that is, it does not matter whether you are talking about convolving x 1 with x 2 or x 2 with x 1, they are the same thing. We prove this. Indeed, x 1 convolved with x 2 evaluated at t is integral x 1 lambda x 2 t minus lambda d lambda integrated over all minus to plus infinity. Put t minus lambda is another variable alpha for every specific t. Now, notice that when you do this, let us identify what happens to the limits. Of course, lambda is t minus alpha and lambda equal to minus infinity gives alpha equal to plus infinity. Lambda equal to plus infinity gives alpha equal to minus infinity. Moreover, 
d lambda is minus d alpha. So, we have all these little changes to be made. So, if we make these replacements, you notice that you can replace d lambda by minus d alpha, t minus lambda is just alpha. So, I will write that down here, t minus lambda is alpha, lambda is t minus alpha and then you have a minus sign and these limits also reverse. So, the minus sign together with the reversal of limits cancels one another out. So, this is cancelled by reversal of limits. So, what I am saying is that we could rewrite this as minus infinity to plus infinity x 1 t minus alpha x 2 alpha d alpha and that is the same as x 2 convolved with x 1 evaluated at t. And since this is true for every t, it is quite clear that convolution is commutative. So, you know for every t we have established this, for every individual t, let us write that down. We have established this for every individual t. Hence established x 1 convolved with x 2 is the same as x 2 convolved with x 1 for all t proved. Now, a very similar proof can be given for discrete time convolution. For the sake of completeness, let us complete that proof also. So, what we would have there x 1 n and x 2 n being convolved. So, x 1 convolved with x 2 evaluated at n is just summation on all k x 1 k x 2 n minus. Now, again for a fixed n put n minus k equal to l which means k is n minus l. And of course, summation k going from minus to plus infinity is equivalent to summation l going from minus to plus infinity for a fixed n and for every fixed n. Therefore, what we have is x 1 convolved with x 2 evaluated at n is also summation l going from minus to plus infinity x 1 n minus l x 2 l and that is the same thing as x 2 convolved with x 1 evaluated n. This is true for every n hence proved. So, we have completed the proof for the discrete case as well. Now, we go back to the continuous example that we had begun with. I would like to calculate that convolution. So, you know you, you notice I said without loss of generality, you know. So, let me draw the two pulses again and then it will be clear what I am trying to say. I have these two pulses which I want to convolve, a pulse of length t 1 and height a to be convolved with a pulse of length capital T 2 and height b. And I said it is without loss of generality that we said that one of them is greater than the other. We could take as we said b to be greater than a as we did, there is no problem with that. Or uh, I mean the longer pulse is the second, b to be greater than a and t 2 to be greater than t 1. Actually well that is not without loss of generality, I mean which pulse is higher or lower in height is not without loss of generality, I must correct myself there. Uh, in fact, it does not matter what the height is. Convolution is actually a consequence of essentially linear operations being done on the system. So, when I scale up one of the inputs, the output is scaled by the same amount. So, in fact, I can say a stronger thing without loss of generality. If I take pulses of unit height, albeit of different widths, so capital T 1 and capital T 2 need to be different for the general case and I need of course, to evaluate it for the general case where t 2 is different from t 1, but I do not need to evaluate differently for different a and b. I could without loss of generality take a to be equal to b equal to 1 and then if I want the answer for any other a or b, I could simply multiply the output by a b. So, let me without loss of generality 
take a equal to 1, b equal to 1 and t 2 greater than t 1 as I did. So, let me write that down. Without loss of generality, we will take a equal to b equal to 1 and t 2 greater than t 1 here. This t 2 greater than t 1 is without loss of generality because of the commutativity of convolution. It does not matter which one is longer, the convolution would not change if we interchange them. That is why I am saying t 2 greater than t 1 without loss of generality. I am saying a equal to b equal to 1 without loss of generality, because if you have any other non unity a or b, you simply multiply it by that a and then by that b. All right. Anyway, let us now calculate this convolution. So, we will set up the process. We will have to have a train and platform here too. The only change is that the train and platform are now very dense in passengers, occupancy by passengers. Passengers are as close together as they can get, tending to touch one another, tending to become a continuum. So, you know, unlike the discrete case where you could identify this passenger and the next passenger, the notion of next is there in the discrete case, the notion of next is absent in the continuous case. Take any two passengers, no matter how close, there is another passenger which is between them and distinct from them. These passengers are indexed by the continuous independent variable. So, uh, now the question, since we know the convolution process is commutative, let me choose the more convenient of the two, x 1 convolve with x 2 or x 2 convolve with x 1. One of them is likely to be more convenient. And naturally, if we have assumed capital T 2 is greater than T 1, it will be convenient to fix the one which is longer onto the platform and then move the train which is shorter. So, we will move x 1, we will make x 1 the train and we will put x 2 onto the platform and we shall work this out in the following session. We shall work out the convolution entirely in the session that will soon come.